The idea that the human race is not just one community of which we're all citizens, but one family of which we're all members is as old as civilization itself. Several religions trace the human story back to this couple. But as the Old Testament makes clear, the human family quickly became extended, complicated, and conflicted. Look what happened in only the second generation. The peace of Eden gave way to the war of Cain versus Abel. The lesson, all wars are fratricidal. They're civil wars within the human family. One of the early and long-lasting ways that was used to preserve peace among nations was to subsume many nations into multi-ethnic empires. And one way to think about imperialism is that it was a giant construction project that brought fractious tribes and cultures together under a single authority. Babel was the archetype of empire in its most ambitious universal form. Its rulers saw their city as the capital of a global kingdom, a true world government. But neither the authors of the Old Testament nor, much more importantly, the God of Israel saw Babel as a utopia. A utopia. And that was because somewhere inside the tower, or in its shadow, were subject peoples who yearned to be free. So the Lord confounded the language of this vast and all-inclusive empire and dispersed its inhabitants so that they could find their own lands, fly their own flags, and, of course, speak their own languages. And that's what happened over the centuries with all empires, including these six, Egypt under the pharaohs, Babylon, the historical prototype of Babel itself, Rome under the Caesars, the Mongols under the Great Khans, their descendants, the Mughals in South Asia, and the Ottomans under the Sultans. Long story short, empire was an attempt at global governance that ultimately failed. And why did it fail? Because in these cases, and all others, nationalism proved stronger than imperialism. Dying empires gave birth to new nations, many of them forerunners of ones on the map today. And you'll see on this slide how those six empires encompassed what are now about 40 states. They include the two largest in population and the largest in territory. But for small nations, the process of breaking free from huge empires was often particularly bloody, and rarely more so than in the Thirty Years' War of the 17th century, which reduced by a third the population of much of Europe. Yet that war was so devastating that it led not just to peace, but to a new kind of peace, the Treaty of Westphalia, which created a relatively stable system based less on empire and more on what would become known as the nation state. One example on this map is a country called France for a people who had come to think of themselves as French. But the system of Westphalian stability was shattered when one Frenchman in particular set about conquering countries in the name of liberating them. In other words, he reverted to imperialism. And here's how far Napoleon got before other continental powers ganged up on him, defeated him decisively at Waterloo, exiled him to the farthest ends of the earth, and then with him out of the way, entered into a marathon of diplomacy known as the Congress of Vienna. And the result was the so-called Concert of Europe, a peace that lasted more or less until 1914 when this happened. The shot heard round the world. An 18-year-old nationalist assassinated the ultimate imperialist of the time, the heir apparent to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And that random act of violence by an otherwise totally anonymous small figure in the backwater of Europe triggered what was truly a world war. That conflict had profound consequences for Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent, the Far East. New forms of military technology 
like tanks and mustard gas, and tactics like trench warfare, seemed calculated to guarantee stalemate and massive carnage on the battlefield. The toll was staggering. 8.5 million soldiers died, and so did 13 million civilians. But once again, all that destruction led to another of those construction projects that was an advance in the great experiment, namely this, the League of Nations. Here seen are its headquarters on the banks of Lake Geneva. But the U.S. boycotted this organization. There are no Americans in this picture of the League's officials at work. And partly for that reason, the League failed abysmally in preventing the Second World War, which set a new record in the annals of that human habit that the Bible dates back to Cain and Abel. Ending that war fell to an odd trio. Each of these three had quite different ideas about how the world should be governed. Joseph Stalin's ideal was a global dictatorship. Winston Churchill, for all of his virtues, was a diehard imperialist, while Franklin Roosevelt was almost as, imposed, uh, as opposed to imperialism as he was to communism. He had in mind a post-imperial, post-colonial world when he conceived the United Nations. And by the way, he conceived that term and that concept before Pearl Harbor, originally to be an alliance that would defeat the original axis of evil, but very much with in mind a post-war means of keeping the peace. That body, the United Nations, while far from perfect, was a considerable improvement on the League of Nations, largely because the U.S. was and remains its most powerful member. I particularly like this photograph of the U.N. Note the flags arrayed in front of the U.N. headquarters on First Avenue. They symbolize two features of the organization that are in some tension with each other. First, the nearly 200 member states retain their sovereignty. Most people on the planet pledge allegiance to only one of those flags. But while still sovereign, that is self-governing, those nations like their flags often line up together and act collectively in pursuit of common goals. In that sense, on some issues, the whole world must be self-governing. And one issue in particular met that standard survival in the face of what I'm going to show you now. Now what you have been listening to and seeing there was intended as an innovation in the technology of warfare. But this quantum leap in the destructive power of weaponry was so destructive that it had the paradoxical effect of making war between the major powers suicidal and therefore obsolete. Nuclear weaponry not only led to mutual restraint and mutual deterrence, but it also led to the creation of a new international system for keeping the threat of destruction at bay. And that system was based on a complex set of treaties. One that is still in force today began with the so-called Atoms for Peace proposal that Dwight Eisenhower made to the UN. That led to a series of test ban treaties starting with one that John F. Kennedy signed. That in turn led to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, here being signed by Lyndon Johnson's representative and the Soviet foreign minister. Then came the SALT-1 anti-ballistic missile or ABM treaty between Richard Nixon and Leonid Brezhnev, and SALT II, signed by Jimmy Carter. The Strategic Arms Reduction Talks, or START, were begun by Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev, and then consummated by George Herbert Walker Bush. 